straight tape. This is a, an interesting section, challenging section. We'll start off by showing you where to trim. Set your, your uh, pair of dividers up here for about oh, three quarters of an inch. And give yourself a scribe. You get a double joggle here. You're, you're in the first joggle above this trim edge. Do that down the entire length, cut on that line. The result here is three quarters of an inch to just under. You determine that very simply by this portion. You can see where the foam core ends. Make sure I can, you can see what I'm seeing. Let's look up here just a little bit. Foam core ends here. And that where that 90 degree bend is, that is your water line right there. The distance from there to there, you will not change on the lower portion of the strake. Do not trim below that line. Trim to that line, that's fine. Tuck your blade right in that corner and use it to follow. Don't go below it. Uh, this is the portion of your strake that sets up everything on your strake, uh, the whole installation. This is a very large, lifty portion of the wing. It'll have an awful lot to do with how your airplane handles and feels in roll with different speeds. So get this right. Trim to that line, don't exceed it. And that will abut that cleft, that edge right there. So you have to have the distance from there to there exposed because it will slide down and go right up to, to the, the base of this foam. It doesn't have to, you, have to, you need only about five eighths of an inch. Done, you're going to cover this whole thing with four plies of glass from well beyond that point to well beyond it on the other side. And putting 12 plies of glass in the middle of this bond. So my next trim is going to be underneath that lip from one end to the other. And then we're going to put the two halves together and clinkle them. Back with you, Dan. Okay, we're back. We've trimmed this. Um, in retrospect, I'm just realizing if you want to make sure that everything is okay, you don't have to have this line absolutely straight. Just make sure that you, you address the trimming I talked about at the very tip, at this crotch, and at the end. If you keep anything perfect, just keep the bottom, the middle, and the front end there absolutely pristine as to the cut to that, to that small little return that's on there. And you can use those three points as your reference and it can wander in between. But uh, it would help if you just endeavor to cut it straight the, from the very beginning. Now that we've trimmed the two, we're going we're gonna to fit the two together and position them in the clicos. And I'll uh, get set up for that and be back with you in a moment. Well, it's a little dark down there. What you're looking at is right down the leading edge D section of, of a strake. Let's bring this up here. Come on back. And you, you, I don't know if you can see it specifically, but there's the depression for the underside, and there's how far down the leading edge comes. If it's net net, there's no gap between the two. And it runs that way all the way down. Now the, the distance that the foam core is from this edge is not important, providing that the foam core does not get in the way of how the two relate. Full length. You can have as much as an inch worth of gap, but it's not going to matter if the foam core is way back, but you don't want the two incur having an incursion upon one another. That will create problems later. I'll flip this thing around and I'll show you what it looks like from the opposing side. As it sits, what you're seeing is the only thing holding these two straight calves together at the moment. Just a very good fit at the bottom. And as you notice, we'll go up the leading edge here. There's nothing holding it together. We get to all the way to the top. Nothing. No super glue, no bondo. Nothing. I'll give you a pan back here and show you what it looks like as a whole. And in this 
this area, see it, it still moves. And you pull it all up, pull it together like so. That's when you run your first clicker in right here at this crotch. This is where it changes. Pull it up tight. Put two or three down, its, down this straight section and two or three up in here. And then we're going to fit this thing to the right spar and fuselage side and wing collectively as a unit, making sure that it fits. Uh, and then leveling and leveling this at the same time along this edge. This trim line is what we level to. Next we're going to show you how to trim your gear doors. Bring this into focus and you're going to see two lines. Not easy to distinguish. The first one is there. The second one, I'll get into a shadow here, is next to it, in border, about, oh, about an eighth of an inch apart. I think down here it's areas. Now it's really visible. You see the first ridge right there and the second ridge is right there. First represents the, the vertical on your, your gear leg depression where your hinge goes. And this actually represents how much material has to be removed to facilitate the hinge's placement. Now you can even see it more prevalently up above. Um, being on top of this stitched Kevlar salvage makes it more difficult to see there. It's really easy to see there and there. And when you look down at it in normal light, it's, it's a little easier to see. It's certainly not easy in this light. So we'll go on to that, but let me show you how it fits here in the gear leg depression. And we'll move you down. There's the only molded gear leg and, and uh, wheel well depression uh, in the kit industry. I'm not at all proud of that, I guess. But there's a part line here on the door. There's a part line there, very easily uh, seen. I'm going to trim to the outside of it. I'm going to trim to the inboard line of the two. And uh, I'll be back with you in a moment and show you how it should fit and then how it relates to, to the opposing door, which it is molded to mate. Uh, we'll trim to the lines and um, then we'll show you how to fit the hinge. Back with you in a moment. Okay, we're back. There's not 10 minutes of work in the entire process of fitting this piece. And I'm going to give you a close-up and show you a minor warp that occurred in the tool. Unfortunate, but something that you should be aware of so you know how to get rid of it. There's that little bit right there. That's in the tooling. It's not a change of this part. And it's consistent from airplane to airplane. Um, this is the right lower strake. I don't believe it's in the left. Uh, but what you'll do is you'll remove a small amount of material from this corner and this corner from the U-door itself. And then you'll sand a little material right here and a little in the front. And by the time you're done, you'll have about a 0 .02 mismatch from corner to corner over the entire thing uh, that when you put your, your bottom surfaces on and you do one thin fill, You'll have a, th a thin fill to do on one edge across a diagonal corner, but that's all the fill you'll have on your door. The, the door on the inboard surface you'll find will fit absolutely perfect with no uh, warpage or tendency to uh, not fit perfectly. Uh, I'll be back with you in a moment to show you exactly how much material I, I go to remove. Okay, we're back. <coughs> Something I want to remind you before you trim your hinge, which we haven't talked about yet, is we're going to place the hinge at full length. See, I've got a half of one piece here, and I'm going to go to the end here and uh, place the hinge uh, just inside the edge of this radius. So we've got a little radius there, and uh, well, that looks like about the right length. I'll give you a dimension here in a moment. We're going to cut that. The hinge is reversed, as you can see. And the hinge will go in this fashion. Um, oops, it will go in this fashion. And uh, cut the hinge off, position it, rivet it to this. I'll show you the, on your ailerons and your rudders. 
you radius this so that this would nest into the corner as close to the hinge as possible. You do the same radiusing here. Then we'll rivet, rivet the hinge in place, drill and mat and um, match drill this number 20, um, which is the drill size for tapping 1032. Uh, and that will position this door. We'll be back with you with each element of that as we progress. Okay, little short vignettes here, little pieces of tape. Notice the, the beveled off end here. Cut back. This is just inside the radius in the corner, as is this on this corner. And this is going to sit just like so. You know, see the, the little joggle right there in the end is what sits on top of the flats, and there's one on each end. The hinge has to sit inside of those joggles. Now we're going to do a quick and dirty bevel here. And it's not going to be that easy to do because we are on top of Kevlar. seen this before, I'll uh, finish this up and show you the results. Now we have the radius figured out. It nests in very nicely, neatly, all the way across, all the way up to the edge. Now we determine, okay, we've got the hinge equidistant here and here, I'm missing the radius. I put a mark, put a mark in here, check the placement, you're about 0.15 out here, there's our marks, there and there, now without having to go any further with referring to the, the wheel well, I can place the hinge and rivet it in place, I'll lay out the rivet marks and come back and show you what spacing and placement. This is the aft face of the gear seen in this fashion and this is the forward face this is then this is the forward face to your right position just so that you can see a close up of how the um, spacings are on, on the gear door of the other rivets starting at the rear we put one right in the middle of the first half inch wide tab this is a, a quarter five sixteenths of an inch from this edge right here measured over. Um, we put that line down and just give it a mark. Zip, just like so. The next one is middle of the next hinge on that line. Thereafter we go uh, middle, um, two, three, mark. And we come over, so you can see it's, it's um, every third, remember we put one in the center, 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 and I will show you that to the right. You can see the spacings. There's a rivet every inch and a half. Those spacings are a half inch apart. Actually, it's a rivet every inch. Pretty standard. They're eighth inch rivets. O condition or ADs would be sufficient. This is uh, very substantially attached. The edge of your hinge, I can see it through the tape, is right there. So you can see I've got it 5 sixteenths, um, th and then uh, just about 3 eighths of an inch, and then 5 sixteenths to here. It's drawn right on down the middle of the hinge. Remember, that is the edge of the hinge right there on the opposing surface. So you've got plenty of spacing. You'll drill these 8 inch, click over 2 or 3 of them, and then finish drilling up the rest of the holes. Set your micro stop. Uh, with a 100 degree countersink so that your rivet heads are flush on these surfaces 
and um, I'll be back to show you what that looks like in our next bit of tape. Well, we're back, and we've kind of sunk the holes. Hope that's clearly visible. Careful not to countersink oversize. I'll show you some rivets in here and how they should look. We gotta focus. That's pretty flush. See the dimple in the center? That indicates it's an AD rivet. No dimple, it's an O. It sticks one diameter beyond the hinge up to a diameter and a half. Two diameters is a bit much. You can get away with it if you're careful, but one and a half diameters is perfect. One, one diameter is the minimum. Two diameters is maximum. There is a diameter and a half. That would be perfect. Perfection. Now we're going to lightly scuff up the back side of the hinge, this face, and then we're going to sand this surface and uh, put resin in the holes so that resin gets on the rivets, on this surface, and on the anodized surface of the hinge. I'm not going to put a whole lot of resin on here because I'm just going to squeeze it all over everything if I do, and I'm not going to waste a brush. So we're just going to do a quick and dirty application of resin. I'm going to make sure that I'm also visible in this. There we go. Okay, cover it up. Now, one, of the, one of the ideas here is to make sure that you, you have no voids between the hinge. You get a bond and you don't have any voids underneath the rivet head. If you've countersunk deeply, too deeply, and you upset the rivet and the rivet's flush, it means that there's something underneath the head of the rivet other than air. It's epoxy. And it'll remain tight. And we'll keep the rivet from working in the hole. Decreases your margin, uh, increases your margin for acceptable error. Now, the hinge itself. I'm going to put a film of resin on my fingers, and that is all. If you have to really push your fingers, uh, then you're putting it on thin. Okay, now then. The trick here is to clean it up so you don't spread resin around. Clean that edge. Flip it over. Put in a few Clicos. You don't need more than three for this particular operation. Those of you who have never seen these, they take a little more fiddling and playing with, but they're well designed. They certainly work very nicely. And you can drop them right into acetone after you're done. You can do that with a regular uh, Clico. Make sure this is all visible still. Still there. Check your rivet, it's an AD, drop it through the hole, and if you're working with someone else's expensive riveter, clean your hands. Now here what I want to do is make sure I'm pushing on the rivet. So 
So I'm lifting with my left hand and pushing down with a riveter in my right hand as I upset the rivet. We're not getting quite enough bite on that, so I'm going to expand this out just a little bit. to show you the finished results. All right, we got it riveted. Nice, neat, clean, solid. Now we put our rivet on in the appropriate orientation. Yeah, get back here, come here. Pin back in place. We set her in here. Take another close look. Oh, it's visible. And take a look here. Pin the hinge, rotate. As advertised. Now the idea is get it where you want it. Get it where you want it, drill it in place. You have to cut this out. And quite simply, you take a pencil and describe an arc that's a continuation of the wheel well. And Get, a, get yourself a saw. Precision here is not paramount. Right now we just want to get this wheel well out of here. So we're just going to cut right into the corner. All the way around. <coughs> and make this accessible. Potted in on this side is an aluminum plate of 707526. Let's get that camera. We need a cameraman here. We'll pick this up and make the bottom visible. Right there. It's part in at the factory at 707526. Harder than the hubs of hail. And um, does a nice job of tapping and holding a good thread. So we'll cut that out. Be back with you in a moment. The last thing I did was to, oops, me, was to show you a piece of tape and not have the mic on. Oh, wow. It's gorgeous. Light. I wanted to show you the results of cutting. Zip, bang, boom, clean. And before we proceed, before we proceed along the lines of, of um, attaching this hinge, which is ultra simple to do, you simply grab it with a clamp from, from the back side. And, uh, well, mark it in place, grab it by a clamp, uh, drill two of the, of the holes to the seven rivets that you intend to put in it, and uh, drop Clicos in it. Well, pull it, before putting Clicos in it, you remove the hinge pin, put it back in place, and then drill it uh, number 20, seven places, inboard enough so that your tap drive handle doesn't get in the way. You can drive it with a ratchet. Um, not a big deal. But first thing we're going to do before we do that is we're going to get rid of this rock problem here. And if you watch here, it's not rocking at the corner. It's rocking forward of the corner first here. So we're going to work that area a little bit, work that area down. And uh, when we get, I'll show you how to get rid of this problem on the right strike, on the right gear door. And uh, then we'll proceed with attaching the hinge. Zero in on this, Mama. Show you where it's at. Give you a complete pan across there and show you what's left. And what had to be done to make the whole thing happen. I'll bring it back just a little bit and show you that side first. You can see that it's down firmly against the surface. Clamps holding it in place before the drilling. 
Now I'll go to the opposite side. Now you notice this is below flush, and I believe you may be able to see the back edge. I'll make sure you can before we assume that. The back edge too is flush. You go to the front there. This is level here. I mean, it's right on the money. And we go to the right rear corner. I'm sorry, front corner. And it's well below the surface. And there's that corner. And it's just up above the bottom ever so slightly. As you can see, it's flush with the surfaces. And that's what you have to accomplish. You have to make sure it's flush. When that dog cylinder pulls on the gear door, it will pull it right down the 0.02 that it's sitting up above the surface. But clearly, we can get the whole thing into the well within a quarter of the thickness of the entire gear door. So we haven't compromised thicknesses anywhere. Um, and we've sanded here, back here, now we're going to lay this out and um, put the screws in place. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Either it'll be six or seven. And there'll be 1032s and 525s with the washer head screw. I'll lay that out and show you what it looks like. Back to you in a moment. Back again. This time to show you a neat little tool that I hope you can afford. 9 degree drill drive. This is going to be the hard area for you to get to. Now we've already checked it, made sure that it's down and flush and fits good. This is the corner where you're going to need it. Down to the aluminum. I don't really need, only really need this 90 degree drill drive in the corners. Um, I can get to everything else. Whole idea here course to just drill two holes, get Kiko's in them, tighten them up, and find out if everything is where we hoped it was. Open it up. Good deal. We got a closure. Time off. Good fit. <laughs> now I'm going to complete the drilling. Um, I'm going to come back to this one with a 90 degree drill drive. Use your straight drill here for these. I take them out to number 20. And there are seven, seven drill holes here. The first one is one inch from a 90 degree end. And 1.15 or so, but the screws are two inches apart. There's 12 inches of spacing from the first to the last, and then every second inch. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, of course. Uh, Drill mount number 20. Tap the surfaces with uh, a 1032 tap. Use tapping fluid when you do so, or light oil. And then make sure you wash all the oils away. Uh, that you might have accumulated and we'll be back with you for the next step. Let's think of anything else here I might need to mention to you. Oh, you can use a ratchet drive, tap drive in the corners where you can't get a full rotation of the handle. This corner especially uh, can be a bit of a boogaboo too. To do, make sure you drill perpendicular to the surface. Um, and that is about it. I'll be back with you in a second. Sure, the only the really only difficult part about this whole thing is getting into this corner. 
and you can use a ratchet type to go into the corner and check perpendicularly the surface. I'm a little on the high side there. 90 degrees to this surface. And I'm going to use a little bit of lubricant here. Use as little as you can. It's kind of like a mold release. Check it again for 90 degrees. Spat out. This makes cutting this thread so much easier with this ratchet tap. Coming through the back side now. The reason we're steps back as far as we are on these, and I'm, oh, I'm step back further here on this rearward one because I'm, I've got a beveled edge closing on the tap. So there we are. Now we uh, reset this, take it the other direction. i just throw this out by my fingers. I'm going to repeat the operation on all of these. Um, I'm not going to put you through it, but it's uh, suffice to say that with that spacing here, I can be 90 degrees to it and still have room to tap. And uh, that's what I wanted to make sure you could see, that I have space to do so. And that dimension, again, since we're making reference to it, is one and a quarter inch from this end and 1.1 inch from this end. It should leave you with 12 inches between screws. Go ahead and go through that operation. I'll back with you in a moment. Well, this will be the last piece for this evening. I've used bolts to hold it in place for now. Um, I haven't tapped all the holes, but these have all been drilled 1032. These go firmly into the board. Fit is excellent. <coughs> and uh, if you wish to use bolt heads instead, just remember that, that you can't put a great deal of torque on an eighth inch plate that's been tapped. Uh, the screw sees only shear loads, and uh, screws are fine and are self-limiting in the way you apply torque to them. So do be careful if you use bolts. And the next step, we will do a quick trim of the adjacent gear door that goes underneath. We drop it in place. This fits this only one way. So we, we trim it to match the uh, surrounding surfaces. And uh, then we install the bottom strike. In Britain, it's 10, 10 in the morning. And what you're looking at is the middle gear door that attaches to your gear leg. Bring it a little closer and I'll show you what I do. You notice know, the fit here is very good. It's a little oversized. Establish the fit here first, and if it seems to be slightly out of position, adjust it and then draw on the outside of the gear door on your straight. And then you can graphically see how much it's oversized, and uh, then you can translate that into to what you're going to sand on this as you, as you sand it. Take your time, make it fit. Leave yourself about a 32nd of an inch gap all the way around the gear door for primer and paint. Back again. This is getting repetitive. There it fits. Everything closes up. We're going to set this aside for quite some time. <coughs> now we can start fitting it on the airplane. The uh, inboard and outboard part lines are the inboard and outboard ends of the molds. If you have any to remove, it's going to be measured in parts of an inch, not in full inches. You have a part line down the back end of your 
There it is. Come on, focus. There you can see it. This line right here. Clearly visible. <coughs> Especially if you're not looking at it through a there it is again. Let's zoom in. And its entire length. And then at the outboard end, you see that little cleft out there? That's the outboard end of the mold that uh, the part swings around. <coughs> but you really should, uh, as before, click over two halves together and then fit them between the wing and the fuselage sides. You'll be amazed how close they come. You get a white out. There's that part line again. Okay, we'll uh, get rid of this. Now we're back. I'll show you some things here that are quite important to the assembly process of the Strake. First thing we'll show you is the relationship of the winglet to the leading edge and to the main spar. What we did first, as you, as you well know, is we assembled the top and bottom Strake and put them onto the airframe as a unit to make sure that they would go all the way to the leading edge and it's easy to tell where they go. It's obvious as the two meet. Currently, of course, the other ones are on the exterior and puts this a little further out. That will show you where your foam core must meet at the back. As if it's too long, you have to trim the foam core away until your glass to glass or carbon to carbon down here at the back end. It cannot be sitting at all on the foam core, so it'll push the whole thing too low. Make sure you have clearance there before you proceed. Then you sand the entire upper surface upper surface of the straight, one inch forward of the glass of the, the, where the foam ends, so that you get a full bond on the inside at, at uh, slightly later. Okay, so we establish this point, you establish the clearances all the way along the back. Then you take a level and you place it along your leading edge of your straight. Now this two ways to do this, and I'll give you both methods. Essentially, you end up with this reading level. Put that inside there. Level. That point translates into a point at the front of the stroke. I'll show you what that looks like here as well. You'll get this right once. Notice how the mark's there. <laughs> Measure down from a projected straight line across the laundrons. That line is six and a half inches from the top of the laundron. Again, Measure straight across, straight down, six and a half inches. And that is the level line for the entire leading edge of the strake. We're going to show you what that looks like in other places as well. Let's check it across here. Should be level here as well. Now I've got the leading edge just a little high out here. So we'll bring that down a touch and see what happens. To that level line. Very close. Most importantly, of course, is to have the outboard edge of your leading edge <coughs> in line here. That you've got an average level in most places. Now right now we're artificially supporting the strake here at that corner. So you have to find a no load condition uh, from which to check it. That may 
may prove to be just a hair high. I'm going to look at this again and I'll be back with you in a moment for an update on this portion of the tape. When I checked it last time, the, uh, I was holding it at this end and it was, it was sagging in the center. Now with no load on it, that's the level line. inches will do just fine. Six to six and a half is a range that you can use. Um, but all you have to do is have the airplane level fore and aft, left and right, <coughs> and then check for a level line across the leading edge. Before we go on with another piece of tape any further, the next thing you need to do is mark the inside and outside of where your strake meets the surfaces. Your strake will have a tab on it that sticks down which will allow you to click on it in several places. Uh, do mark that. <coughs> After making your mark, make a mark an inch or so below the line, an inch above the line, and sand the primer off those areas for about along the side. Then sand inch and a quarter, inch and a half, on to the strake bottom, strake top, in preparation for the two-ply tape inside and outside. Sand all the gloss on the end of the strake away and down in these depressions to make sure that you get a good bond of your, your fillers. And you're going to put your tapes in place. Back with you after the sanding. I'll show you what it looks like. What you're seeing is the upper strake, lower strake, leading edge, click on together, and the line to the right of those projected center lines is six inches from the top of the laundry room. A level was placed on top of the lingeron, making sure that the two surfaces were absolutely parallel. And then that same line was projected to the opposite side to make certain that the two leading edges of the strakes were parallel and on exactly the same water line. We're going to look down the leading edge here. getting ready to cut his other gear door. I'll be back with you in just a moment as, as, as I show you um, what you need to do to make sure certain that your underside is correct. Presently, we're underneath the strake. I'm going to go up inside here, and I can't see what you're seeing because I can't get my eye on the eyepiece. What I'm trying to show you here is the interface between the upper strake and the main spar. And um, what you should be able to see there is the removal of carbon fiber glass and foam in this area right here to make sure that you, your spar does not sit on top of, of the uh, core material. You may have to do that on the upper and lower section. Now hard to do, just grind it away, taper it, round the edges so that it, your surfaces can make nice transitions. Uh, trim that away, both top and bottom. Okay, I was trying to imagine the builder point of view. And the builder was saying, why doesn't he just take the lid off and show it to us from the top side? Huh, so I did. And there you can see the transition. You notice the sanding that's been done forward of the spar? 
Well, the bottom of the spar was sanded too. You're also going to sand that surface right there because you're going to do a tape from here across this transition and there's where it's been sanded. It's foam now. And uh, back here it was done, but you got to make sure you're completely clear. You're not sitting on top of this. You could actually remove a little bit of the front of the spar if you um, don't go more than 3 16 of an inch. You're not going to compromise the strength of the spar any. Okay. Now then, the next thing you're going to have to sand, old joy, old rapture. You're going to be sanding the area, of course, directly behind this strake here, the area above it, and a couple of inches and an inch and a half below it. Actually, if you sand four inches below it, then after you do your taping and it's semi-cured, you can cover it with micro and you've eliminated one extra sanding operation that way. Not a big deal on the inside because this is going to get cut out of here. <coughs> Actually, this area from here to about here, don't bother to tape. From here to... to well, let's see. We'll, def we'll define that for you. Here's the back of your... Of your um, your seat. So sand this area here, up an inch and a half, all the way back to oh, an inch behind your canopy. Here, come on down. So you're going to sand this area above, don't bother with this, but do sand at least the edge where you're going to butt up against all the way back to here. And here is the front of this. So an inch and a half ahead of this, inch and a half above, and all the interfacing area behind it. You're going to sand that that and back. Actually, if you want to sand this whole thing, you can because you're going to do a big layup on there later. <coughs> and last but not least, of course, you're going to sand this area behind this. Don't sand above it because it's going to get cut out of there. And down below, you're going to sand underneath it inch and a, um, four inches below all the way around full length. <clears throat> I'll send that right back to you in a moment. A. The thing I forgot to mention was the bottom three inches there. Excuse me. <laughs> don't need to be sand don't need to be sanded the glass. Just sand the primer sufficiently enough to get a micro attachment. I also forgot to mention that above that, that lip on the spar, you also sand about an inch, and you sand the area from the bolt toward me. Go all the way to the bolt here. You're eventually going to lay up some glass across here. After you do your bond with flocks, you're going to fill, displacing the core area so that it's flush with micro, all the way to here, where this lip is. And then you're going to lay unidirectional material across here. And I'll cover that when you get to that stage, but that's essentially the process. Well, you can see where we've sanded. All the way across. There's the area that goes above the, the bottom of the strake, and here's the area that goes just below the strake all the way up to the front. Now I'll put the, the straight line and show you how it looks. Back again. There's the tape. And it was just the battery dying. Here we are underneath. Spars, uh, strakes pushed up tight underneath. All the way along. And I'll show you a, a line drawn 
here at about an inch and a quarter beneath the strake. There it is. Clear pencil line right at the base of the primer. So I got full sanding all the way along. See it up here in the front. There's my fresh line. The top one is my six inch line. Okay, full length. There's that line. Do I have it back there? I don't know, but we know we've, we've got it. <coughs> and when we look at the top side of the straight, we can see a line drawn. There it is, just above the straight. I know where, where to brush our resin when we reach that stage. Now we're going to sand the, the strake area. Oh, well, we're going to sand the strake. Sorry for the handheld here. We're going to sand one inch now of this entire width for the whole length. And that'll be the last prep we have to do before we actually start slopping resin. Back to you in a little bit that. Okay. I'm going to show you the bottom of the spar here first. All sanded. Nice and neat. And there's the side of the fuselage. Sand it all the way down. Leading edge. Now we'll show you the straight and how it looks. The tape, this is for the last one. I showed you the uh, was straight was against the fuselage. There's the, the sanding. You notice the end of the straight is sanded as well down that, that area right on the end of the straight. Can you unflip up your end straight up? All right. There you go, just like that. Pretty good. You'll notice the bottom end of the strake. Inboard to outboard. You can see the behind the wheel well there. It's sanded in the corner uh, for later considerations. You can also see the area where the foam has been removed to clear the spar. Uh, now on the out, the underside of the strake where it abuts the fuselage. You can see the area. We didn't bother inside the wheel well because we have to cut the wheel well open to lap uni in the air as well as bid. Sanded full length. And we'll back in a minute and show you some considerations on the side of the fuselage to support the straight while it's securing. We go from the forward face of the spar at the bottom, where the lip is, the front face of the lip, to, as you can read there, 26 inches. And at 26 inches, you'll put a little piece of wood between the bottom of the straight and the side of the fuselage. A little block of wood or a little piece of aluminum extrusion. And we go forward, 51 inches. We'll do the same thing. A little piece of extrusion, a little block of wood, and then it's 79 inches. We do the same thing. The VX just shows you underneath where it's going to go, but it'll be actually right against the bottom of the strake. And uh, we're going to tape up to those points. Of course, we can't tape over them. Uh, and you'll finish that tape off later after the, the tape cures and resand the area and retape the area. Um, We'll put those blocks on and show what they look like.